You're listening to Castrol CarCast on Podcast One. Hey guys, we got a fun show for you today. Our buddy Dan Edmonds is coming into the studio and it's going to tell us all about uh, ooh, how, to, how to rate electric cars. We're going to get into the range anxiety issues and charging issues. So uh, we're going to have some fun with that and tell you guys a little bit about uh, my experience in the Jeep Gladiator and the uh, Hellcat Red Eye uh, and more. Before we get started, let me tell you about a Geico. Everybody's got a home. I think you do, right? Maybe you rent it. Maybe you uh, maybe you own it. But uh, either way, it's usually it can be a handful. It's a lot of hard work. But you know what's easy? Bundling policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. And that's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home already. So go to GEICO.com, get a quote, and see how much you can save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com. And, of course, our show is brought to you by our friends at Dodge. Visit your local Dodge dealer where they bring you power performance, great deals, everything you could want in one of these cars. There's no better place, no better time right now because Dodge is offering power dollars. With power dollars, you'll get $10 off for each horsepower of your new car. That's every Dodge Charger, every Dodge Challenger, and you can pull away in a 2019 Dodge Charger RT Scat Pack. It's 485 horsepower, which means you'll receive an almost $5,000 cash allowance. So if you get more power, you get more off. It's that simple. So hurry into your local Dodge dealer today and take advantage of Dodge Power Dollars. Hello, welcome to CarCast. I am Matt, the Motorator D'Andrea, and I'm here with Bill Goldberg calling in from his lovely little estate in uh, in Texas. How are you, brother? I'm back in more ways than one. I guess. <laughs> yeah, so we got some follow up to do on on uh, sort of the uh, abrupt kind of jumping off the phone last week, uh, which uh, uh, but you know it's, it's a good announcement. But uh, before we get started, a uh, we'll little shout out to our friends at Dodge. Let you know that uh, Dodge Power Dollars is the deal going on right now with Dodge Power Dollars. For every horsepower of your new Dodge vehicle purchase, you'll get ten dollars off. So peeling out in a Dodge in a 2019 Charger RT scat pack and you will get four thousand five hundred and eighty bucks off so what a good, good deal right now more horsepower more more uh more deal all right we're here with uh dan edmonds dan longtime friend of mine uh a longtime fan of car cast been on a car cast uh a million years ago yeah good to be back Dan is the master of vehicle testing, and uh, he did a long run with uh, as the uh, director of vehicle testing over at Edmunds.com, and uh, now he's on his own, kind of doing his own thing, available for testing. Exactly. For, for everybody who wants him. Um, so we're going to get into a few things with him, but specifically I want to get into testing uh, some of the electric vehicles because mm-hmm. I think you uh, – I think you – sort of embrace that earlier than anybody else. As soon as electric vehicles went out there, you started coming up with ways to not only test them, but take the results and explain it to us, the, mm-hmm. the enthusiasts, in a way that will make sense to us. Because meanwhile, the manufacturers and the marketing teams and even the government are throwing terms and words and stuff yeah. at us that doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. So we're trying to... Like, learn this new vocabulary so you're going to kind of break it down and tell us uh what's uh what's the real deal behind all of those um so bill so we we kicked off a show last week we got about three and a half minutes into it and uh and then uh your 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 meeting that you were going into uh they called you you started early uh what's the big news brother Oh, man, you know, I got quite obviously, uh, I don't have enough things to do with myself. So at 53 years old, uh, I, I have embraced uh, going back into the wrestling ring. You know, there's a couple things that I I haven't accomplished, I suppose. And uh, why not at the, at the ripe old age of 53 to uh, dust off my boots one more time and go back in there and try to beat the hell out of these young kids? Why not? Okay, so and you're not talking about 
them bringing you back like they've done a few times over the past few years, the couple years we've been doing this show together. You, you know, you've gone in, you've 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 done Undertaker and and, and a stint here and there. You're, this is this is a little bit of a longer deal. This is a commitment. This is you're in. Well, I'm in. I'm in for right now. Um, I'm in for Friday. I'm, I show up on uh, <laughs> SmackDown for the first time. <laughs> yeah. Friday. You know, this world, man, I can't give anything away. But the fact is, you know, I really don't know. I mean, um, we, we uh, are lucky enough to get opportunities and not look beyond the next one. So I'm going to take this one with a grain of salt and uh, maybe it leads to more, maybe it doesn't. But the fact is, is, you know, I, I, I went there, I was lucky enough to, to get that universal championship belt and, uh, I got it taken away from me and I never got like a rematch. So, yeah. I mean, I, I need, I need at least before I hang everything up for good to, uh, to get that rematch, man. And, and to know if I can still do it. I mean, why not? There's a couple of kids out there that need their asses kicked. So <laughs> I think I should, I should, uh, Show them a little respect. Okay, so without they show me a little respect. Excuse w- me. W- without giving away uh, w- what's coming, you know, there's 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 you, there's Bill Goldberg, there's the man, and there's Goldberg the character, Goldberg the wrestler. And without giving away the Goldberg storyline, when when an opportunity like this comes up, does WWE get with you and say? Hey man, come back. Let's do a stint together. Let's see how it feels. Or do they say, "We want you to come back, and we've got some ideas creatively. What do you think? Do you, you know? Do do you start working out some of the creative ideas now, or do they sign you and then you go? You you figure it out as you go. Oh, thankfully, uh, through my years of uh, uh, pounding the pavement, I, I get a little bit more respect. And so we have to talk about we have to talk about creative before I consider, yeah. you know, doing anything like this again. I mean, it has to be, you know, and I'm not a selfish guy. It's not I, I'm not looking to come in and and uh, uh, me be the only beneficiary of of this latest stint. Um, the fact is that there are a lot of kids out there that that, uh, you know, need another push and uh, need a. I don't know. Well, Need you to know, get in like, there uh, with an experienced guy and get some experience. Yeah. And, so the, your role yeah. has changed over the years. You're the veteran now. So uh, your job is is to go back and and be entertaining and be a little bit nostalgic by getting back in the ring. But of course, it's going to be important for you to to advance the storyline and even the careers of some of the younger guys. Right. Like that's the whole. That's kind of the whole point of 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 getting you know the new guys in there with I don't want to say the older guys, <laughs> but with the more oh, seasoned with I the seasoned guys. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, yeah, that's 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 part of the that's part of the allure of the business too. I mean, it's they they call it a rub or they call it whatever you want to call yeah. it, but it's it's experience. And at the end of the day, here we go. Um, <laughs> I I have. I continually have something to prove to myself every day that I'm on top of the ground. And that's just the person that I am. And I believe that I can still do this. And I believe that there's some kids out there that need uh, a, a little, uh, a little teaching. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of coming back to do that on this first stint. And if it leads to something else, wonderful. If it doesn't, then, you know, at least I can, I can uh, prove, prove my point once I'm yeah. back. Well, I want to go to WrestleMania, so if you know a guy, <laughs> you, you let me know. I know a guy. I, 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 I know a guy. You know a guy. I, the last WrestleMania I went to was San Jose, hmm. maybe four or five years ago. San Jose at the Levi Stadium. Levi. Sounds right. Right? San Jose. And uh, it was fun. It was exciting. We. Uh, uh, it's always such a big show, and and – I tell you, like, the crowd is so good for those live events. It's just nuts. I can't imagine the exhilaration you feel with that kind of crowd. Like, we've done live car cast shows. We walk out and there's 60 people, and it's like, this is so much fun. I can't believe these people are here right. to listen and have some fun with us. And I can't imagine what it's going out there in front of 50,000 people. Right. 
right? Like, yeah. no, you can't. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, <laughs> well, you know, look, hey, I don't want to, when you're, when you're, let's just be honest when I'm, you know, 25 years old and I was on top of the world and impenetrable and thinking that, uh, uh, I was invincible. Yeah, it was, uh, not at fifty three. There's just a whole nother uh, group of things to deal <laughs> to yeah. deal with. So well, look, the stress that the stress that I went through then is one thing, but it pales in comparison to what I'm going through right now. Yeah, and let's be let's be honest. Again, you've been through this with me a number of times. Oh yeah, and how and how long have I had to prepare? I, very little, and but here's the we'll thing: cut it in half. <laughs> <laughs> and every time we do, like you've you've done this a million times, but still, every time I, I you know, every time I talk to you, and you're like, I've got to go and wrestle, I'm going to do this thing. You're always you you get a, like a little nervous, you know. You're like, I I got to go do this again, and I'm 53, and, and I got to stand there with no clothes on, basically, <laughs> and with a bunch of guys half my age, and I just want to bring the best show ever. I don't want to fail anybody, you know. I just got to like, like, there's a lot of pressure to perform. At least we go out and car cast in front of 50 people. I get to wear whatever I want. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. If I and put it this way, if if I had that choice this time, I'd be wearing a burka. So. <laughs> right. Well, that's the new um, Goldberg look right is the goldberg with a trench coat <laughs> exactly right that, that'll go over uh, well. well congratulations on the new deal it's going to be exciting i will be watching of course and uh, i know uh, everything that you're going to do out there you're going to bring a hundred percent um as you as you always do so it's exciting um and i'm sure it's going to be fun for gage as well and your family get to see uh get to see uh go in there and 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 you know, yell at the youngsters and beat up some people and uh, and and and, uh, and have some fun uh, for for sure. Yes, sir. All right. Well, yeah. that's that's a big announcement. I want to talk a little bit about. Uh, uh, I've been testing this uh, the Jeep Gladiator. I'm not necessarily a Jeep guy because I've always seen the Jeep as such a tool, like it's such a functional vehicle. And living here in LA, it's it's sort of become more and more of like people just run around the streets with the Jeep. And I'm like, yeah, but... Are you looking at me? <laughs> I'm, look, I'm looking at... Yeah, as Dan Edmonds rolled up in his Jeep that I... And, uh, but you've done more off-roading and off-road testing than anybody I know. So I don't know. I, so I, was, I, I got the Jeep Gladiator. I got the Rubicon. And, and the Rubicon is... That's the one. It's, it's the one. It's got all the good bits and pieces on it, right? It's got the big tires. It's got the 33-inch tires, mm-hmm. I believe. Yep. The tow hooks all over the place on it. And uh, it's like a winch-ready bumper in the front. They can, I think you pop out like a plastic cover and you can put, can put that in there. in there. Yeah, too. yeah. But still, yeah. Uh, this one has the convertible top, and I looked at the book. I was like, I'm going to put the convertible top down. I opened the book. I was like, nah, it's going to take me a month of Sundays sure to figure that out. The old JK book? <laughs> yeah. The new one's real easy. Yeah, well, it said, that, first of all, it said you need these tools. And it had That's like, to take it off. Yeah. Put it down. Oh, because that, that wasn't uh, completely clear when I flipped through it. Um, but uh, it, it, it has all of the Jeep stuff that I expected. It felt a little utilitarian in the, in the inside, like it kind of a flat dash. And mm-hmm. they brought in some of that body color, just sort of a, a play. I'm driving a red one, and the dash looks like it's anodized red. Right. You know? Um, and, uh, you know, the more traditional, like, the automatic shifter and then the four-wheel drive shifter, the two, you know, Wheel drive, the four, the four low, mm-hmm. um, had some pretty cool uh, uh, features where you can disconnect the front sway bar electronically yep. now with a button. You don't have to get out uh, of your vehicle to, you know, it, by the way, four wheel drive, you don't have to turn the hubs, you don't have to do all that. Yep. Everything is electronic now. And uh, so I could see it as a very functional off road vehicle, but do you, do you need it to to putter around the streets of LA? I, I, I don't, I don't know. I just, and the Gladiator's like, yeah, but it's got the pickup truck bed and the doors come off. I'm like, yeah, you could just buy a convertible or you buy a truck or, you know. Yeah, but some people, you know, they want to have a Jeep and go off-road and use yeah. those Rubicon features, the locking diff, the disconnecting stabilizer bar and low range and all of that and get out there and do that. But then they actually need a truck, uh, you know, Monday through Friday. And then there are the overlanders who 
who want to carry some gear with them. And you, that's becoming more and more popular. So the Gladiator's kind of hitting at the right time for that. Right. Okay. So I will add to this is, although I see it as a functional vehicle, that's – and it doesn't fit my lifestyle, but I, it does fit that lifestyle. If you, if you do – pop up to the to the mountains and you go skiing yep. or or you do a little bit off-roading or you can can you fit a motorcycle in the back can you fit a dirt bike in the back yeah, maybe yeah, with like can. the but bed extender or something or, just leave the tailgate down but yeah that can be done that's where it starts to become functional and you only want one vehicle i will say this if you just want one vehicle and you're going to do those things the jeep now seems better on road than it ever has in oh, the yeah. past and uh, although it's still like straight axles and things like that, it's just it's been the evolution of it has has it, it it's it's the Chevy 350 engine, <laughs> right? Like it's just like we keep doing that engine, but now it it like it's good, right? This is yeah, why we do absolutely. LS swap everything is the latest. It's version. a good engine, right? Yeah. Well, so the, the Jeep is that. Yeah, the Jeep has you know really good you know V6 engine and the eight speed transmission. It's a really good powertrain. It even works in a Ram 1500 pickup truck that's heavier. Uh, so in this vehicle, it feels really nice. And uh, But the um, the chassis with the solid axles that you mentioned, I mean, that's one of the things that makes it so good off-road because it can just articulate like crazy. But they have refined it with the, the recent uh, JL Wrangler, and that carries over into the Gladiator. They've refined the interior to make it really nice every day. I mean, mine's the generation before, and it— feels like a tractor inside. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, you know, this new one, you know, you've got a really nice Uconnect touchscreen. All the buttons yeah. and knobs feel like they're not just out of a parts bin. They've actually been designed yeah. for this vehicle. And even though it's styled to look like a Jeep and it has that vertical dash and vertical windshield you mentioned, there's no – it's nice. And then, you know, if you're looking at a, a mid-sized truck and you have a family, it's actually got one of the bigger back seats. The only one that's bigger is the Ridgeline, and it's like on the opposite end of the coolness and off-road spectrum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's definitely a city truck. Yeah. Actually, I drove it. I kind of like it. It is nice. it is so comfortable. Like, you, you have no idea it's a pickup truck. You it, just think it's a SUV. Yeah, and if, if you were honest with yourself about how much you really needed to go off-road, you yeah. might buy a Ridgeline. Yeah. And we actually— took one to Death Valley, a place called the Racetrack, which isn't a racetrack. It's a dry lake, the one where all the rocks move. You might have seen it on the cover mm-hmm. of National Geographic or something. But to get there, it's like, I don't know, 27 miles of washboard dirt road, but not just any washboard, like really brutal stuff. And we took one of those down there a couple of years ago with a Tacoma TRD off-road package. And the Ridgeline shocks held up and the Tacomas popped. And oh just wow! Just melted down. It was amazing. So I mean, there was no approach angle or articulation involved in that. It's yeah. just a dirt road. But it, the, the ridge line did better than the uh, Tacoma did. Bill, have you driven the new Jeeps at all? No, I have not. Actually, I have not. Have you no, ever owned not. a Jeep? I kind of feel like maybe oh, yeah. there might have been a Jeep in your life at one point. Jeep Wrangler back in, uh, God, my rookie year of the Los Angeles Rams, I would uh, commute from Anaheim to La Costa every morning in that Jeep. Wow. What year do you think that was? Oof, I think it was a 90, nah, 92. Oh, so All right. there's two or three generations of Jeep So evolution. between 92 oh, and yes. 2019, yeah. they've been about the I same? I missed the number. <laughs> no. no, they've made... <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> no, the new one is... Quite a bit. Yeah, the different. new one is nice. It's still but... solid axles, and it's still going to, uh, you know, mm-hmm. not deal well with uh, the choppy freeways we have here. But we're only going 15 on those things most of the time, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I, 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 the, I've been driving the Rubicon, and like I said, that has a lot of the features in it, the off-road package and the Fox shocks on it, and it has all the good stereo bits, and it's got the leather interior. But now it's 58000 bucks. Yeah, right? if you put all that stuff on it. You don't have to. You can get a Rubicon for less. But yeah, right. you can spend sixty grand on one of those. At sixty thousand, do you do you get a Raptor? Or do you get a, a gladiator? It, it kind of depends because a Raptor's more for bombing across the desert and Is skimming it? across the top of the whoop de doos, whereas yeah. the gladiator's for going off in the rocks. Or, you know, just more because the glad I'm the uh 
the Raptor's really wide. So there yeah. are some places, you know, it just doesn't fit. But a Jeep's kind of narrow and can get into tight places. That's kind of what they're all about. And even though the Gladiator's wrong, longer than a Wrangler, uh, it still does uh, a good job out there. It, it seems like you have to do some of that that sort of that rock climbing kind of off roadiness to really appreciate the vehicle. Yeah. Because if you're just cruising around on the freeway, valet parking at the steakhouse, and then you know four, five, six weekends a year, you're out in the in the you know with your dirt bikes or in the snow. Eh, you yeah. could go either way, right? I get that, you know, but- you you could. You could go with the pickup truck. By the way, the Tacoma, the Ranger, anything, let's say anything four-wheel drive versus, you know, how much off-roadiness right. do you need? Do you need a Raptor? No. no. <laughs> do you need a Gladiator? No, but Maybe. want Trump's need because, you know, we can talk – we talked about the Ridgeline. How yeah. It's really actually a nice, you know, truck. But you have to be a real logically-minded person to come to that conclusion. Most people just say – I want the Gladiator or I want the Raptor, yeah. you know, if they can afford it. I I was a little surprised. Well, first of all, driving the Toyota Supra uh, the week before, I wasn't surprised by everybody going, hey, that's the new Supra. That mm-hmm. looks cool. Plus, it was bright yellow, so it caught a lot of attention. Yeah. Uh, but I was surprised how many people came over and said, oh, that's the – that's the new Jeep truck. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, not a lot of people know it's the Gladiator for some reason. I don't know, because there's so many variations of the Jeep name. Is it, yeah. is it Rubicon? Is it, is it Wrangler? Is it what, whatever? And they're like, it's the Jeep truck. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I was, I was I'm just photographing it uh, in, a, in you know, one of the public parks over here, like the parking lots in, right. uh, and, uh, in, in the marina and the, you know, like the beach cities. You know, parking enforcement guy comes over and is like, I want to say his uh, Chevy Colorado. And uh-huh. uh, he rolls up and he's like, what's going on? I'm like, I'm just photographing this thing. Is that cool? He's like, well, I'm here to do parking enforcement, so you're going to get a ticket. And I go, I'll be three minutes. He's like, yeah, I'm just messing with you. It's fine. <laughs> he goes, I just wanted to see your truck. It looks cool. <laughs> and, uh, so first of all, I like the – I don't know how many people, city people you meet, 100,000, and the one guy who's got the sense of humor about it, he's like, right. yeah, I'm just. it's cool. Take your time. Do whatever you want. It was a. It was an entire parking lot. It was 300 spots. One of them was taken, right. and uh, then there was me, and he's like, yeah, no, I just wanted to come check it out. I was like, all right, that's good. Uh, I I don't know. It seems it seems good. So what's so Bill just picked up. You got a Ram. You got a gas engine Ram. It's not diesel yep. because you're gonna hot rod it. And uh, yes. uh, which 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 version did you get? Uh, the heavy duty, the twenty five hundred. Nice. Mm-hmm. So I'm pulling the motor out and putting the Hellcat in there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> of course. I, I thought you were going to yeah, hop well, up why, that Why motor. not do it right before Dodge does, for God's sake? Oh, yeah. Been waiting for it for so long, you know. Um, doesn't Dodge have sort of their version of a Raptor, the Raptor competitor? What's the name of not that thing? Not yet. They have not a power yet. wagon. Well, they don't yet. They have the power wagon, which unfortunately falls a bit short. And I told you about yeah. the quote-unquote warlock I was supposed to be driving at NCIS, and the one showed up. Uh, it, I can't remember the name of it, the, the, uh, the version that they sent, but production looked at it and they uh, said, well, we need a Raptor. So, um, yeah, they're, they're supposedly coming out with one soon. We've seen some spy shots of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, can they make up for the lost time? I don't, I don't know. We'll see. But, um, that's a, a, a space that they have been void in for a long period of time. And I think it was a mistake, but you know, they, uh, overtook the muscle car market there for a little while and, concentrated on that but i think now there's a lot of people clamoring for that vehicle and and the raptor does need a competitor and i think it's going to happen because you know i saw the what they called the trx concept at yeah. the uh texas state fair it was probably two years ago or 18 months ago and it got a great reception and you know the spy photos that you're you're mentioning uh, i think that's gonna be pretty faithful to that concept and if so 
it's going to be bitching because they have the quarterback. Yeah, spring. but they but think of the ground they would have think of think of the progress they would have made if they would have come out with it immediately two years ago. Yeah, yeah, but I mean they're going to have a, a, a bitching motor, and you know I I really like the first generation Raptors engine. The second one is powerful, but it it doesn't sound that great to you me. You know, it's funny because um, I, I I drove them both. Bill drove, uh, I think, the second gen um, down on his property down in Southern California, which is basically an off road track. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I I do like that. I like the styling of it. I oh, like yeah. some of the the, the you know sort of the. Uh, the advancements they made over the Gen 1, but mm-hmm. I did drive a Gen 1, and then I drove, like, a Roush supercharged, like, 600-horsepower version of the Gen 1 with the 6.2-liter above the supercharger, and uh, and now it's, now it's really getting fun, you know, on, <laughs> on a vehicle of that size and that weight, and with 600 horsepower, now it's, now you're really having some fun with it, and, uh, and it, it would... It would still like with the big tires and stuff. It would still hook up pretty good with that kind of power, and uh, and of course with the Roush exhaust and stuff, it was it was crazy loud, and it really kind of made it like a muscle truck, like a real kind of muscle truck. So I see how the new Raptor, the turbo version, uh, didn't really live up to the sound, but it's got the fury. It just the yeah. Sound there's is... just enough in the aftermarket that I'm sure it can help out with that yeah. a little bit, but uh, uh, but kind of interesting. Um, and then uh, the other thing that I just started driving like a day or two ago uh, is is the Dodge Challenger Hellcat Red Eye, and uh, we've talked about it a lot because uh, Bill drives one, and and we like the engine, we like the power, and it's it's interesting how this came up for me was uh, a year ago. At Roadkill Nights, we drag raced Hellcats, and then we went to Springfest and drag raced uh, Challenger 1320s, and then we went back to Roadkill Nights, and what did we race there? Uh, more 1320s? What was last August? I think more Challenger 1320s, right, Bill? I think that was right. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I think it was the 1320, yeah, if I yeah. remember correctly. Yeah, I think we raced the 1320 again. Of course, we know why. It's because we raced the Hellcats, and they're crazy fast with the supercharger, and Richard Rawlings went into the wall. So the next year, they're <laughs> like, hey, let's run the version that's, you know, 100 horsepower, 100-something horsepower less. Uh, so, so, so since you've driven that one, could you imagine taking the red eye down there in that celebrity shootout? No. So th- that's the thing is I we went to uh, we went to the – to the red carpet premiere for um, the new documentary Uppity, the Willie T. Rib story. We've been talking about it for the longest time, and uh, and today, as this show gets posted, it drops on Netflix. So now on Netflix, we have three movies: we have the Twenty Four Hour War, we have Shelby American, and and Willie T. Ribs. Uh, so we went to the premiere of that, and that was the first drive. And the, actually, the only other red eye I drove, believe it or not, Bill, was yours when we, you showed up at Springfest with a couple cars, and I drove it at seven miles an hour from the parking lot to the parking area. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and I was like, so no, no real indication of anything. No, no real indication of anything. And, it, you know, it's, it's what I expected. So getting back into the car, I, I forgot that uh, these cars are big. Oh, yeah. And uh, and I can see why you like them. I uh, I put my left foot down. I was like, "Where's the dead pedal? I can't even find it." And it was so far to the left. I was like, "Oh, I need bigger hips or something." Like I, <laughs> it, it, uh, I can see that it's a big roomy car. Um, but uh, and we'll get into this more next week. But the two things that that uh, I figured out very quickly is one, that thing is so crazy power that. Just an inch of throttle on the gas pedal, and the tires are breaking loose. It's difficult to drive that car fast because it just wants to spin around in circles. <laughs> <laughs> and and the red eye is a wide body. So the other thing you figure out is with that much tire in the front, it just tracks and grooves goes into every groove and nook and cranny and you're like <laughs> you're like this is not actually the easiest car to drive it's it's insane and it's fun but uh you have to focus 
Yeah. You know, you definitely that is have. an absolute understatement. And you know <laughs> yeah. what? Hey, man, you're a you're a smaller stature guy, <laughs> and I can only imagine how uh, how roomy that thing was when you jumped in there. Um, because for me, I mean, it's it's like the perfect grand touring car. It, I can honestly put that seat back, although I am torso man of my. My uh, inseam is like a 32, but um, I can put the seat all the way back and barely touch the pedals. So, I mean, it's a, it's an extremely roomy vehicle and, and opposed to like the Viper. I mean, I actually have shoulder width, shoulder yeah. room in there. Yeah. So it's, um, it's a, it's a killer car, man. But, w- but another thing that lends itself to how dangerous it is, is that it is so roomy, especially for a guy like you. So you're yeah. not like locked down in that seat when, when you're tooling around in that 800 horsepower monster. Oh yeah, it's just like throwing you around inside yeah. of the car. And and look, that thing's 4,500 pounds, and if you can feel the heft, but you're like, it's not on the rear tires. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> All that weight is not on the rear tires because I even this morning I just I just it's it's been cold out here, and last night you know having a little bit of fun with the car, and that was. 20 minutes into the drive this morning, you know, cold tires at, oh, yeah. you know, 48, 50 degrees outside, almost from an idol that wants to spin the tires. <laughs> like you couldn't believe how, how easy it was. Like you're just pulling out of the parking spot uh, and you hit the gas a little bit and it just, it just breaks you. If you're like, what's the deal? It looks like it has so much tire. I don't know why there's so little traction. And you realize well, what's, that- ter- what's terrifying is trying to merge on a highway going seven, 60, 70 miles an hour here in, in Texas and, you know, punching it a little bit and getting sideways, literally at 70 miles an hour. I mean, yeah. with no heat in the tires. The, the thing is, it, it, just exactly how you said, you have to be a, attentive uh, to the nth degree in that car. Yeah. Yeah. It's anyway, I'm going to have more fun with it uh, over the next week. Um, uh, but for the events we've done, the drag racing we've done, I went into this car with already like a preset level of caution, like, because when, when we hit the drag strip, even in the 1320s, which is far less horsepower, I know how easy those cars break loose. So I got into this thing and I didn't, I didn't do that move where like the guys who, you know, buy the car and they've had it for nine hours and they're already run over like three trees and, (laughs) and, uh, jumped the median and, or somebody who works at the car dealer's like, Oh, we got one on the lot. Let's see what it does. It just, it spins around so easy. Yeah. You really (laughs) got to be gentle and roll into that throttle. You can make that thing go fast, but you got to really feather that throttle. Um, all right, I want to get into some of this electric car testing stuff, but before we do, I'm going to tell you about our friends at Zorro. If you guys purchase supplies for a small to mid-sized business, Zorro.com is your go-to resource. They have tools and safety equipment, office supplies, shipping, cleaning, automotive supplies, pretty much everything, including specialty items you can find pretty much that you can't find anywhere else. They have brands that you know and trust. They have Stanley, 3M, Prestone, Black & Decker, uh, rubber made and uh, uh, they're pretty much everything there. They're all at competitive prices. You want to check them out. And now they have fast and free shipping on orders of fifty dollars or more. And uh, they have a really good U.S. based customer service team as well. So visit zorocom slash carcast. Sign up for their Zmail newsletter, and you'll get fifteen percent off your first order. That's zoro z o r o dot com slash carcast for fifteen percent off. Zorro.com, it's all you need to make your business go. All right, so uh, I read I read an article that you did recently, Dan, mm-hmm. on Autoblog right. testing the Porsche Taycan. Taycan, Taycan rhymes with icon. That's how you okay. can remember it. Okay, because I so uh, the Super Bowl commercial, the heist, the Porsche commercial that uh, uh-huh. that came out was good, and I saw sort of the the behind the scenes stuff, and I was trying to pay attention to how all the Porsche guys call that car. Right. Uh, uh, so Taycan, yeah, Taycan. Okay. Yep, you got it. Um, and when it came out, they said the range was. 201. Yeah, 201. that was the official number that was published. And everybody was like, it seems a little low. Like in the Porsche world and that price and 
It seems like it should do better. I, I don't know. The threshold kind of feels like 250 minimum is kind of what you're going for. You've got Jaguar I-Pace and so many other competitors out there that can uh, that can do that. So you test electric vehicles for range. Uh, how did the Porsche do? And the second question would be, how accurate are the I don't know, the MPG ratings, basically, uh, the range ratings for electric cars, the advertised range right. versus what's really happening. Well, there's a lot going on there, actually. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, the EPA has a procedure that everybody follows. And I think it's important to know that, you know, the manufacturers can submit data and then the EPA either, you know, ask questions or... Uh, there's a little back and forth, but they eventually approve the manufacturer's uh, test results, and then the rating comes from that. But sometimes they'll do a spot check. So, um, but in case of electric cars, it's different from MPG because back in the day when the Leaf came out and it had like I don't know 70 miles of range or something like that, you know, we were all fretting over range anxiety and how yeah. are we going to use this? That's not going to work. And you I know, saw a few of them parked on the side of the freeway. Yeah, I was one of those <laughs> once. I I actually was able to use that as a as a way to talk myself out of a yeah. carpool sticker, but <laughs> ticket. But that's another story. Okay. But uh, yeah, the um, the range is smaller than it might be in practice because I think the 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 idea is they don't want people to run out because they know that running out is a flatbed, right? It's the winch of shame onto a AAA yeah, flatbed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, they, um, they purposely basically discount the number by 30%. So whatever the test result is, the number that goes on the window sticker is 30% lower than that. And now, Porsche's doing that or everybody's everybody, doing it? Everybody's everybody. doing that. 30% we, seems like too th- big of a number. Well, that's the point that I think uh, we're at now. Back in the day when we were all worried about making sure people didn't run out and realizing that there were lead-footed drivers out there who would use more, uh, they wanted to make sure that everybody was, you know, understood clearly what they could get out of this car. And so um, – but as I've driven EVs and I've driven pretty much all of them, I think the only one I haven't driven personally is the Kia Soul Electric. But I've driven like – both Leafs, the, the Mini E, the original Mini E, yeah, yeah. the Coda, uh, and I've tested all of these as well. And one of the things I've noticed with all of them is it doesn't take much to exceed the rated range. And that 30 percent factor explains that somewhat. Um, in an MPG rating on a car, they don't do that. And you know, as we all know, it's pretty hard to like match that number. You know, yeah. we're pretty happy if we get within two most of the time. And <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I'm sure there are people who live uh, in rural areas that don't drive very fast who get the rated MPG, you know, all the time. But, I mean, if you're in a city and a place where everybody's hauling, hauling butt, you know, you're not going to necessarily see that. But in, a, in, in an electric car, if you drive normally and especially in the city, you can exceed it. Like I've had a couple of – Fiat 500Es as personal cars. They're rated at 83. And routinely, I would unplug them and it would say 116 miles based on how it's been driven before. So, yeah, it's pretty easy to exceed the range. And I'm not in the camp that thinks that you got to have 250, you got to have 300. I think that's gasoline thinking kind of permeating the situation. But uh, certainly, um, there's more there than I think uh, the ratings indicate. Now, if you're a lead foot and you drive 75, 80 miles an hour in Texas all the time, you might you might not agree with me. Right. <laughs> hey, I, I, uh, I resemble that fact. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, uh, it's, it's, <laughs> by the way, the, the Jeep I drove, I was probably, I was struggling to get 16 miles per gallon. Yeah. Like I was like, oh, I'm going to try to get 16 out of this thing. By the way, V6, not, you know, it's just, eh, maybe, Mine we, does could do 14, little, maybe so. we could do a little better. Um, and uh, and then the red eye, I was like, I don't think I can get nine out of that thing, especially <laughs> the way I'm driving it right now. Right. Um, but the thing about EVs is they have torque. And, you know, we've been marketed horsepower and it certainly 
really cool in a raptor and all of those and, and the red eye. But if you're just bopping around town, torque is what gets you off the line. Yeah. And gets you, in, you know, to, on a merge and all of that, just getting up to 30, 40 miles an hour. And EVs have that in abundance. You know, yeah. Even like, an e-golf has that. I, I'm, I'm curious to see what, what uh, GM is up to because their Super Bowl commercial about the, about the Humvee, uh, the Hummer coming back. And, yeah. and everyone's saying 1,000 horsepower and like three second zero to 60. You know, do we need that in a pickup truck? Uh, I, I, I don't know. Is, I don't know. And I, what is it going to weigh? 10,000 pounds? Those things were already know. big to begin with. And unless it's going to be some smaller version of a, 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 uh, yeah, of a we'll have to see. Yeah. But I mean, electric pickups are going to be interesting because the towing part gets a little complicated. Yeah. All right. So I have another question for you. But first, let me uh, let me tell you guys again about Dodge. Visit your local Dodge dealer where they bring you performance, technology, and great deals. There's never been a better time because right now Dodge is offering power dollars. With Power Dollars, you'll get $10 off for each horsepower of your new car. Every 2019 Dodge Charger, every 2019 Dodge Challenger, everything out there. That means you could pull away in a 2019 Dodge Charger RT Scat Pack with 485 horsepower, and you'll receive an almost $5,000 cash allowance. So if you get more power, you get more off. It's that simple. So hurry into your local Dodge dealer today and take advantage of Dodge Power Dollars. So the other thing we don't take into account is the efficiency of the electric vehicle. And what I mean is, is all right, we all say, hey, it's got whatever battery. It's got a range of 250 miles. Maybe mm-hmm. how you drive it, you can get 260, 285, two, you know, 290 out of it. But when you go home and you plug it in, what does it take to charge that? What does it cost to charge it? What, is it is it spinning your 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 little power meter? Uh, you know, like uh, like an episode of The Simpsons right, or right, something. Right. You know, like uh, the nuclear power plants running <laughs> overtime trying to charge that thing. There's got to be a way to like. Is that something we should be looking at? And is, is that a, a comparison? One of the comparison factors between electric cars? Well, certainly that that has a bearing. You know that. You know, electric cars have different consumption rates, just like gasoline-powered cars. And uh, it's harder, though, to know how much you're actually using because, you know, most of the chargers don't have meters on them like gas pumps do. But, you know, like I have a juice box, uh, that's the the brand name, uh, at home, and it has a connection to a phone app. And so I can see how many kilowatt hours uh, it took to refill the battery after I drove it. And kilowatt hours in electrical terms, are a quantity like gallons are in gasoline. And that's how you're billed on your electricity bill. So I'm Edison, and I think I pay uh, $0.24 a kilowatt hour. Uh, And so that works out to, um, you know, here's the problem with electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. There's math involved. There's (laughs) math involved. There's math involved because, first of all, you have to know what a kilowatt hour is. You've got to figure out how much you're paying, and then you've got to figure out how much it used. And 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 the meter in the car isn't going to tell you how much it takes to refill the battery because there are charging losses associated with charging. The cord gets hot. Uh, there's cooling yeah. systems that make the battery happy while it's being charged. Those can amount to 20%. So you put 10 kilowatt hours in the battery, you have 12 that you paid for. And that's just a fact of life with electric vehicles. But it all works out to it's – quite a bit cheaper than a gasoline car unless you've got a Prius and you drive really slowly. <laughs> so it's it's cheap. I mean, we've had two of them in our household for three years and we compare like the, the, the electricity bills from one year to the next, you know, when I didn't have an electric car and when I did, and it didn't really change appreciably. And that's because well, we drove like 15 miles a day. You know, so it gets down to how many how many miles do you drive? Yeah. Does it did you find any noticeable difference and it might not be significant, any noticeable difference on when you're charging the car, what it takes to charge the car based on the day or the temperature of the day or where the car is, if it's cold outside and the car is outside or if it's hot in the summer and it's outside or versus in a garage in the shade, does does the temperature like the like? Do you tell everybody 
hey, the ideal condition is put your car in the garage, have it be 68 degrees in your garage just because it's blocking out the sun or 70 degrees and that's the best charging condition? Or is it a little cold? Is it a little warm? Or does it not make a difference? Well, I mean, for where we live, it doesn't make a difference. It doesn't make it. It's always 70. It's, yeah, 72 it'd, degrees. It'd be know. outside, inside, it's like always Adam 72 always degrees. says about his uh, yeah. Yeah. weather. But if you're in a warmer climate, that's not too bad because actually the optimum charging temperature is a little bit warmer than it might be here normally. But, okay. but certainly when you get to cold weather, that's going to change things. And people are also going to run the heater to preheat the car while they're charging. So when they get in, it's nice and toasty. And that uses juice. So, uh, But I mean in coastal areas where the temperature doesn't vary wildly, it's not really an issue. What is – the most efficient when it comes to charging, which vehicle and which one's the shittiest? <laughs> wow. Well, see, this gets into my testing because yeah. the, 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 the shittiest one uh, is, according to the EPA ratings, the Porsche Taycan Turbo at 49 kilowatt hours per 100 miles. Uh, the bigger is, is worse in the way they do uh, electricity because they do it in a consumption. So it's not – Anyway, it's opposite of MPG. So uh, 49 kilowatt hours per 100. But I did my test. uh, It's also rated at 201 miles, as you mentioned before. And I did a test where I just drive normally around Orange County. I have this course that goes around the perimeter. Yeah, stoplight, stop signs, traffic, on and off. Other cars, you know, 55-mile-an-hour sections, 25-mile-an-hour sections, kind of normal driving. And I don't drive like a grandma, and I don't drive like somebody who's late for work. I'm right – In the middle, and I did two laps of my course. That's two hundred nine miles. Had two had excuse me had seventy eight miles left. So that's two hundred and eighty seven miles. If I would have run it out, which nobody does, right? So you you did two eighty seven right based on your math on a car that's rated at two hundred one right. And then when I filled it up at home, yeah, I mean I I measured how many kilowatt hours went in, and it calculated the consumption at thirty. Four point, the number is in the Autoblog article, but it's 34.8, nothing close to 49. So, okay. so there's the rating and then there's what you can do if you just – depending on how you drive. And it seems like electric cars might be even more sensitive to that, mainly because the rating has that, that, that factor in it, that 30 percent factor. But also because uh, you know, if you're not – going 80 miles an hour all the time, mm-hmm. if you're driving around town, that's their happy place. You know, they're unlike gasoline cars. They do way better in the city than they do at high speed on the highway. Yeah. Okay. So so then the – oh, you also asked about a good car. Yeah. So the other end of the spectrum is going to be your Chevy Bolt. Uh, I don't know which one's got the lowest, but the Bolt and the Kona and the Model 3 are all kind of down there at 20 – Five, give or take, somewhere in that uh, number of kilowatt hours per 100. What was their rating versus their actual? Was Were they close or were they as far off as, let's say, Porsche is well, on, on the rating? I have, I have exceeded the rating handily on pretty much every car except one brand. Yeah. You can probably guess which one it is. Go ahead. It's the one that everybody – buys that that would be the tesla the tesla we've had all three and yeah I've, we've had them for over a year at at my previous gig and i kept track of all the charging records and it's not as easy to do what i did in the porsche what i did in the bolt what i've done in an e-golf in a 500 e uh, you, you know exceed their range really undershoot their consumption rate tesla not so much so most of the other car companies are are a little conservative on their range numbers, but Tesla tries to get – I mean I, I don't know what's going on. As uh, accurate as possible? Maybe they're just trying to get a, a more accurate number or I, maybe – I'm not they, sure. Yeah. I, I, I'm not sure. But you know, to me though, the whole issue of range is not as uh, big an issue as most people make it. Even though, you know, 201 had people up in arms with the Porsche, I wasn't even concerned if that was the real number because having owned one, you're plugging them in at home every night. And if you drive 30, 40 miles a day, that's all you really have to worry about is that. 
if you go on a road trip, and I road tripped a Model S to New York City and back in less than a week. We had the cross-country record yeah. for a time. And we went at most, I think, 100 and – well, the average distance between supercharger stops was 135 miles. It, it was nowhere near the car's range, and it was faster to do it that way. Yeah. So because charging takes longer if you're trying to get every last kilowatt hour in the battery. So it was easier to do it that way. So even range doesn't even matter on a long road trip yeah. as much as people think. Okay. All right. Well, we've got a lot more. We're going to have to have you come back in and tell us a lot more about it. Bill, is there, a, is there an electric car in your future? <laughs> oh, that type. Yeah, I don't uh, The Porsche looks good. I saw one the other day. Oh, oops. We lost uh, – Yeah, lost it sounded Bill. like you got disconnected. Yeah, I got disconnected. Uh, but no problem. We're wrapping things up uh, anyway. Um well, it's uh, Dan Edmonds. He's in the studio with us. You can follow him on Instagram. He is Suspension Tuna. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> suspension Tuna, like the fish, on Instagram. <laughs> and uh, on Twitter, he's Edmonds underscore test. It's uh, E-D-M-U-N-D-S underscore test. So follow him right. on Instagram. Follow him on Twitter. Get all the good stuff. He does a good suspension walk around and there's a new one on the Tycon, which just went up on autoblog on autoblog check that out you guys can get a deep dive into the suspension of uh of that car so uh uh guys thank you so much uh for listening of course we're at carcastshow.com we're also now on spotify so if you guys want to move over to that service or tell a friend uh we're on spotify uh you can follow me at motorator on uh, instagram facebook uh, you know, Twitter, it's, it's all the same. It's all the same. And uh, and Goldberg, give him a follow on Instagram. He's Goldberg95. And uh, Goldberg's Garage. You can see all the cool car projects and stuff that he's got going on over there. And uh, I think that's it. We're going to wrap it up for now. And uh, until next time, keep the air and the spare and the bag and the wheel. For the latest updates and call-in times, follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at CarCast Show. If you'd like to write in, fill out the form on CarCastShow.com. And don't forget to give us a nice rating on iTunes. CarCast is a Corolla digital production and is produced by Chris Loxamana. For more information, visit CarCastShow.com. CarCast Show.